In addition to structure for any biochemical complex or machine, you really need to know something about the dynamics. So I've gone over this whole splicing cycle with you, but as I explained before, the splicing cycle is based on the um, stable, the complexes that are stable enough to be resolvable on a gel or affinity purif you can affinity purify them. Uh, but it doesn't tell you about the kinetics of things coming and going. So for example, is, is it going to be true that on every intron, U1 has to come before U2? And do these two have to come before the, the uh, triple SNRP? And all of these arrows that we're showing here are one-way arrows. But most biochemical reactions and chemical reactions really are two-way. So it, are these arrows really one way? Is it a one-way street? Or is this process in any way reversible? So to get at that information, I've, my laboratory has been recently collaborating with Jeff Gallus's laboratory at Brandeis University um, and Virginia Cornish at Columbia University, as well as some co-workers at uh, New England Biolabs to develop new tools in order to look at uh, the dynamics of the spliceosome. The main method that we have been utilizing is called total internal reflectance. Now this is an experiment that you can try at home. So this is simply a laser pointer that's going into an aquarium of water. And at, if you correctly position the laser pointer at the critical angle, when there's a change in refractive index, in this case between water and the air, then all of the laser light will be completely reflected. That's called total internal reflectance. Um, except right at the point where the laser uh, contacts, there is a um, little bit of energy that goes to the other side called the effinescent wave. So the effinescent wave, it, it, now in this case now we're going to be having the lasers come through the air to a microscope slide. So here is the change in, uh, the, the, the change in, in refractive index is going from the microscope slide to the, to the uh, aqueous layer above the microscope slide. The effinescent wave will go about 100 nanometers uh, into the solution above the microscope slide. So imagine having not just one laser, but let's say three different colors of lasers. Um, it turns out we can now do five lasers. I'm only going to show you three. Whoops, that was four. Three today. Um, and, uh, but imagine having the three different colors of lasers all going in at their critical angles and having something tethered to the surface within this uh, 100 nanometers and having uh, molecules that are fluorescent in the, the colors that are excited by your three different lasers. So molecules that are in solution above the effinescent wave are not fluorescent because they're outside of the area where the, the light energy uh, is. And so only the molecules that are tethered to the surface are going to be fluorescent. So we can use this to then ask for anything that's tethered to the surface, what different colored molecules at any one time are associated with the molecule that's tethered to the surface? So let's just see how this looks. So imagine you're uh, looking down on this surface um, and we're going to be looking at the, the molecules on the surface. So we call this technique co-localization of single molecules spectroscopy or COSMOS. And this technique was pioneered by Jeff Gallus and his coworker Larry Friedman at Brandeis University. So now we, here we are looking at the um, fluorescence and each of one of these spots is a single molecule on a, a glass uh, cover slip that has different colored uh, things on it. In this case, these are the, the, the molecules are a strand of DNA and the colored things are different oligos that are complementary to that strand of DNA but they have different floors on them. And so you can see for example that this molecule of DNA had all three of the oligos uh, bound to it but this molecule of DNA only had this one and it only had the green and the blue uh, bound to it and you can see here's one that only had the, the blue molecule bound to it. So this is very simple because all we're doing is we're looking at this, say, constellations, these different constellations of, of spots, and we're going to learn something about our biological system. And in particular, if we can 
look at the, how these spots change over time, we can learn about the dynamics of the system. Now, in order to use this to study the spliceosome, we had to develop a number of different uh, new technologies to enable us to label parts of the spliceosome so that we could see them. And so one of the things that we had to do was to uh, create fluorescent, fluorescently tagged pre-mRNAs because we need to know how, where the pre-mRNAs are on the surface. Also, our pre-mRNAs have to have some way to be tethered to the surface. The way we do that is to put a biotin molecule on one end and then we also have biotin uh, on the, the glass surface. We have biotinylated PEG, um, uh, polyethylene glycol. And then we make a sandwich where we, we have streptavidin. Streptavidin can bind four molecules of biotin. So you can use that to make a sandwich and, and bind your RNA there. Now, the other thing that we had to develop were other ways of tagging the SNRPs. Because what we really wanted to do was to look at the SNRPs coming and going in real time. So the way that we're uh, tagging the SNRPs are using two protein tags. One is the SNAP tag that was developed by Kai Janssen and is now available through New England Biolabs. SNAP is based on a protein that um, is, is a suicide enzyme that removes alkyl groups from uh, guanine nucleotides and DNA. And so it transfers those alkyl groups to itself. So in this case, if you have uh, guanine, the uh, benzyl guanine, so here's guanine and then there's a benzyl group on it, and if you attach to that a fluorescent dye, then the SNAP tag protein will transfer that dye to itself. And if you've made a fusion protein between the SNAP tag and uh, your protein of interest, in this case a SNRP protein, then you can specifically label your SNRP protein. Here, uh, the other tag that we've been using is the E. coli DHFR, di dihydrofolate reductase tag. And um, bacterial dihydrofolate reductase uh, binds very tightly to trimethoprim, this molecule down here. It's a non-covalent interaction. Trimethoprim is an inhibitor of E. coli DHFR. But this molecule does not bind to eukaryotic uh, DHFR. And so, uh, but this is a very tight interaction, and um, so again, if we tether a dye to that, this dye will interact with our DHFR tag and allow us to um, label that protein. And this technology was developed by Jenner, Virginia Cornish and her co-workers at Columbia University. So how do we get these tags on our SNRPs? The way that we do this is we're using the yeast system, and we're using homologous recombination. So we make... Um, versions of different protein genes that we want to tag, in this case two U1 proteins and a U2 protein. We then uh, place the tag of interest at the C-terminus of that protein or, or the gene for that protein and then we have a, a selectable marker. And we use homologous recombination to put these modified genes into haploid yeast. And that means that the only gene that is encoding that protein in the yeast is um, our protein of interest, our tagged protein. So then we, um, from those yeast strains, we can make a whole cell extract. And in this case, we have U1 having two DHFR tags on two different proteins, or, uh, in, or U1 uh, having two tags and U2 having a SNAP tag on it, so a triple tagged strain. Um, we then take those extracts and we either can just simply add the uh, TMP to label the, the DHFR or to label the SNAP tag, we take our benzyl guanine that has a fluorescent tag on it, we react that um, with the whole cell extract, we remove the excess dye by gel filtration and then now we can add our, our TMP. And so the um, really great thing about this system is first of all, we know that the proteins that we're tagging are active because one, they're the only copy of the protein in the cell um, and we, have, uh, we are only a tagging essential proteins. Most of the protein, many of the proteins in the spliceosome are essential. Um, and so we know that if the cells grow because splicing is essential, then that protein must be active. 
Secondly, there's absolutely no protein reconstitution required. So we're not making any recombinant proteins and purifying them and putting them back in. We're using the endogenous proteins. We've just added a, a small protein tag to, to the thing. Okay, so let's, think of, let's look now about how these experiments are going to go. Um, so we're, we've, we're going to um, have our pre-mRNA that's attached to the surface via this biotin streptavidin sandwich. It has a fluorophore in it so we can keep track of where the pre-mRNA molecules are. And this is actually a, um, a view through the microscope of what a field of these pre-mRNAs look like where each one of these spots is a, a single molecule of pre-mRNA. And in the uh, movies I'm going to show you, we're going to be looking at U1 SNRP binding to those pre-mRNAs uh, over, over time in splicing reactions. One of the things about single molecule reactions is that um, a lot of time, for single molecule reactions, you're really seeing everything that's going on, anything that's fluorescent, any kind of dust or anything you can see. So you, so you really need to do a lot of controls to make sure that you know what you're looking at. So the first thing I'm going to show you is, some, is a movie where we're doing some controls where either we have uh, left off the fluorescent RNA or we've not, we've left, we don't have the tags on U1 SNRP and so we wouldn't expect signal and or we have the complete reaction where we have the um, fluorescently tagged RNA and the fluorescently tagged SNRP. So let's watch that movie. This movie shows two control fields of view and then one experimental field of view on the right. The field of view all the way to the left um, is we have the wild type pre-mRNA present. We, don't, we can't see that in this field of view because we're not looking in that channel. We're looking at the Psi3 channel, which is the TMP channel. And we also have the Psi3 TMP in the extract, but there is no tagged protein. So you can see that we do have a little bit of background with material binding uh, non-specifically to the, the slide. And so it's important, to, this is why it's important to do those controls to make sure that your background is not uh, too high. Uh, in the middle panel, um, we now have the tagged U1 and the Psi3 TMP, but we don't have any pre-mRNA on the slide. So again, we only see background binding. And then in the rightmost panel, which is the one with all the blinking lights, um, we have all three components. So we have tagged U1, we have the uh, pre-mRNA on the surface, and we have Psi3 TMP. Now, one thing that you can see immediately from this is that U1 interaction with the uh, RNAs is highly dynamic. So even in the absence of ATP, U1 is binding and releasing multiple times from uh, each pre-mRNA. Now that we know our system's working, let's really do some experiments. And the, the really cool thing about these experiments is that you can just see the answer with your eyes. So I'm going to show you um, some movies next where we've put two fluorescent tags on each of the major subcomplexes. So in one uh, extract, in one, in one quadrant, you're going to see uh, extract that's labeled, has labels in U1 SNRP, as you've already seen, on two different proteins. Then we have another extract that has labels on U2 SNRP on the U5 component of the triple SNRP and also on the, the 19 complex. Um, and it, in this first set of movies, we're going to uh, not have ATP present. So in the absence of ATP, we, we've known um, from the, the studies on gels um, that the only complex that should form is this E complex. So only U1 should be able to stably interact with the uh, RNA. So now let's look and see if that's the case. Here's a movie showing four different extracts with each with a different SNRP labeled in each extract, either U1 in the top left-hand corner, uh, the triple SNRP in the bottom left-hand corner, U2 in the top right-hand corner, or the NTC in the bottom right-hand corner. 
And in the absence of ATP, what you can see, uh, as we saw in the previous movies, that U1 is binding, coming in binding reversibly. But um, for all the other SNRPs, we do not see any uh, significant binding over background. If we take the data from each of those fields of view and simply count the number of spots over time, what you can see, the, the total number of spots over time, what you can see is that in the absence of ATP, only U1 builds up. And uh, none of the other SNRPs or the NTC really have much occupancy at any one time in the absence of ATP. So now let's let's run the whole spliceosome cycle. So now we're going to add ATP and see what happens. This movie is now in the same order as before, but now we've added ATP to the reaction. And if you watch very carefully, you can see uh, the apparent order of addition of the SNRPs. So early in the movie, and the movie is continually looping, you can see that U1 is uh, binding and, and coming and going. Uh, the next SNRP to um, build up is U2. And then uh, after U2, we start to see U4, 5, and 6 uh, come up. And then um, the NTC, we see less of it, but it, it accumulates much later in the reaction. So what you can see from, from this movie is that we can see in, in real time all four of these SNRPs binding to the surface that's covered with pre-mRNA molecules. And um, as I will show you in the next slide, we can see that all of the SNRPs are binding dynamically. That is, they're coming and going. That None of them are coming and staying permanently. One of the things that you can see from those movies is not only uh, can we see that all of the SNRPs are binding in the presence of ATP, but unlike the uh, spliceosome cycle that I showed you before with, with all the one-way arrows, all of the SNRPs are binding reversibly. And we can see this by, and, uh, here's looking at one, say, individual uh, RNA molecule, and we're just looking at the intensity uh, over time for that one RNA molecule. And you can see for U1, uh, it bound twice. Here's, here's an RNA molecule where two molecules of U2 bound, U5, and the NTC. The reason uh, we don't just see um, two binding events, oftentimes, especially for U1, we'll see three, even sometimes up to 10 binding events. The reason that we're showing these particular traces is that it shows you that these, this binding is due to reversible binding and not due to photobleaching. So photobleaching is always a problem in these single molecule reactions because uh, under the intense uh, laser light, the dyes can often photobleach and then they go blank. And, and then when the signal disappears, you don't know whether it's because your complex has gone out of the effinescent wave or your dye has photobleached. So this is why we attached two different fluorophores to each SNRP because when we see the stepping behavior, this is either due to dye release because we're using the DHFR tag or it's due to photobleaching. But that means that this molecule, which went away in one step, really had to be a molecule that went away. The, the whole complex went away um, because the, it's very unlikely that you'd have two simultaneous photobleach, photobleaching steps or two simultaneous uh, dye, um, dye steps. And also you can see it went away and then another one came back. Okay, so again, this is another one of the controls that you need to do when you're doing single molecule experiments. All right, so thinking back to those movies, um, again, if we count up the total number of spots in each frame and just plot that number here, so and this is, would be the number of dyes per pre-mRNA molecule, you can see now in the presence of ATP, U1 uh, builds up first, then U2, then U5, and then the NTC after that. So this gives us an apparent ordered process for spliceosome assembly. Um, and it's consistent with that, but it doesn't actually tell us that for any one molecule that the um, spliceosome assembly was ordered. But we can test that directly with our single molecule methods simply by following two SNRPs at once. So now we can, we're going to do three color experiments. 
So one color on the uh, pre-mRNA, one color on, in this case, on U2 SNRP, and another color on U1. And in the same experiment, because by watching these SNRPs uh, simultaneously, we can see, does U1 come first or does U2 come first? Um, and so here's what these data look like. So, so here again is one of these individual single molecule traces, but this is one uh, pre-mRNA molecule where U1 and U2 came to the same pre-mRNA in the same extract. Uh, and you can see very clearly that you, in this case, U1 came first and then uh, U2 came. But we can quantify this by measuring the on time for both U2 and, then, and U1 and taking this uh, difference, the, T, U, um, the time of arrival of U2 minus the time of arrival of U1, and that's the delay time between the two. So if that number is positive, that means that U2 came before, U2 came after U1. If that number is negative, it means that U2 came before U1. And then we can look, we can look at this number uh, over many different pre-mRNA molecules. So this is a uh, so-called probability density plot. It's a bar graph where the probability density is the bin height uh, divided by the bin width. Um, and the, the important thing to see is that here we're looking at 82 different molecules and that almost all of them had a positive number for this uh, T, TU2 minus TU1. So that means that on almost all of them, um, U2 came after U1. Now there were a few here where U2 apparently came first, um, but we could, that, that would be consistent with the um, amount of labeling of our extracts because we can't get completely 100% labeling. Uh, it's just, it is impossible without our extracts dying. So we have about 90% labeling efficiency in our extracts and this level would be consistent with a dark U1 have coming before uh, U2. So the, it's not inconsistent with an ordered model. So we've done this for all of the uh, pairs of complexes. Here's um, U2 versus U1. This is another set of data now with 111 molecules. Here's U5 versus U2 and here's the NTC versus U5. And so you can see that all of these, um, uh, most of the, the events this gives you a positive number, so therefore the second complex came after the, the, the first complex. And so that leads us to um, conclude that for this particular pre-mRNA that we've been working with, and this is RP51A, it's a model splicing substrate in yeast, it is a highly ordered uh, um, assembly pathway with U1, uh, almost always preceding U2 and then the, the triple SNRP and then the NTC comes after that. But what we now know that's new that we didn't know before is that every step in this uh, pathway is reversible. So that means that the um, spliceosome um, is not, or pre-mRNA is not necessarily committed to splicing at the very first step with, with U1 uh, addition but that it, it increasingly gets committed as you go through the, the spliceosome assembly pathway. Also, in terms of alternative splicing in the human system, if the spliceosome can be uh, uh, disassembled, for example, here at later points, then you could imagine you could inhibit splicing of particular splice sites anywhere along this pathway because it could go backward uh, along the pathway if it's inhibited. So this has important implications for our understanding of alternative splicing. Finally, I need to thank the people who actually did the work. And obviously anything this complicated uh, took many, the input of many different people. And so from my laboratory, I showed you to data, data today from uh, Melissa, Aaron, Danny, Eric, Jing, and Nick contributed. Um, we also, uh, all of this work was done in collaboration with Jeff Gellis's lab who developed the Cosmos technology, in particular uh, Larry and, and Alex. And then also the uh, Cornish laboratory who developed the DHFR labeling technique. And finally, uh, the New England Biolabs uh, for their help with the SNAP tag. And this work was funded by HHMI and uh, the National Institutes of Health. Thank you very much.